Hey, y'all. I'm Rob. And I'm Erica. And you're listening to Pumpkin Spice. And Nothing Nice Podcast. This is Episode 8, The Five Second Rule. Trigger warning. Topics discussed in this episode may not be suitable for all listeners. Recording. Oh, excuse me, I burped. <laughs> <laughs> the first second that we're recording and I burp. Oops. There is a recording in progress. Hello. Oh, God, I just hit my elbow, too. Shoot. We'll get okay. started eventually. No. <laughs> <We're> now. <laughs> okay. So this is going to be a super long episode. It just is. Um, But it is on your most favorite things and sort of mine. Um, We're going to talk today about the five second rule, which is just kind of a name that we're going to throw on it. Um, But we're going to talk today about foods that used to kill you. Or that still do. Do you want to start? I did do a little research on the whole five second rule um, intro, if you'd like me to to take off with that. Yeah, let's start with the five second rule. That sounds good. Okay. Before I get started, I want to throw out credit to CDC.gov, Wikipedia, Mayo Clinic, History.com, and various other sources. But this is from MarthaStewart.com. And it says, when food falls on the floor or any surface, the level of contamination is based on the dirtiness of the floor or surface it falls onto, as opposed to the time length that is there. Paul Dawson, a professor at Clemson University, performed experiments with salmonella contaminated tile, wood, and carpet surfaces. He then documented the results of dropping dry white bread and moist bologna slices onto them. Waiting for inter- intervals of 5, 30, 60. Say that word again. Baloney. Moist. Oh, moist. I thought you were, I thought you were making fun of baloney. <laughs> moist. Baloney slices out of them waiting for intervals of 5, 30, and 60 second time frames, measuring the number of bacteria on the bread and baloney after each interval. The results showed high levels of contamination regardless of time interval, but the moist baloney, moist, had more bacteria and the carpet surface contaminated less. So the question is, should you eat food that has fallen onto a different surface than you were intending? It all depends on the cleanliness of your environment. Time has no regard for absorption. But and, so and what's what I say? You can't eat at everybody's house. <laughs> you can't eat at everybody's house. Um, what I'm going to cover today is along more of the lines of things that have been put into foods or things that you ingest. And you are going to look at foods themselves mm-hmm. that were poisonous at one time or considered poisonous or that have a significant effect on history. Yes. So, I'm going to let you now take it away with your foods. Oh, I get to go first? You're going to go that. first because I'm going to talk a lot. <laughs> and then when All you're right. done, you pull up a pillow and a blanket and just settle in for, for a, a, a nappy nap story. A nappy poo? <laughs> nappy poo. Uh, well, I have Kofifi. It's fine. So the first thing I want to talk about isn't so much a food per se, but it's more along the lines of something that grows on food, right? So we're going to talk about ergot. And um, so first and foremost, ergot is very widely known, especially in the medical field. And it has been since like the ninth century, right? And well, the 10th century, going into the 11th century, They've known about ergot, what it does and how it affects people, right? But basically, for those of us that are not familiar with what ergot is, it is a fungus and it's a member of a group called claviceps. And it's a fungus that grows on rye and other wheat-like plants. It produces alkaloids that can cause ergotism and it happens in humans and other mammals. And it gets 
affects you when you consume the fungus as it's attached to grains. So what exactly is ergotism, first and foremost? It's um, a severe psychological or pathological would be a better way to put it, pathological syndrome that affect humans and other animals that have ingested the plant material containing ergot. There are two types. The first type is characterized by muscle spasms, fear, and hallucinations, and the victim may appear dazed, be unable to speak, become manic, or have other forms of paralysis or tremors, and to suffer from, from hallucinations and other distorted perceptions. This is because it deals with the serotonin levels in the brain. It's caused by serotoni serotonergic, serotonergic stimulation of the central nervous system because of some of the alkaloids. Ooh. So it's like a second, really, really bad high. It sounds like a really bad high. Yeah, Super like bad. Thing. <laughs> Super bad. Um, the second type of ergotism is marked by violent burning, absent peripheral pulses, and shooting pain of the poorly vascularized distal organs, such as your fingers and toes. Um, and that, and it's caused because ergot can also affect the vascular system in a situation called vasoconstriction, sometimes leading to gangrene and loss of limbs due to restricted blood circulation. Oh my gosh. That sounds like a lot of fun in general, I think. That's that sounds fun. really scary. That sounds like a really bad time. <laughs> Their neurotropic activities of ergot alkaloids may, as I have said, cause hallucinations and irrational behavior, convulsions, and even death. Um, it can cause uterine contractions, nausea, seizures, high fever, vomiting, loss of muscle strength, and even unconsciousness. Fun fact about ergot, though, back in the Middle Ages, they used it to induce abortion. Oh. They did. They did. They used it to induce abortions and to stop maternal bleeding after childbirth. That's super fucked. That's super, something. super. But do you <laughs> really want to know the most substantial fun fact about ergot? I do. It has been argued that ergot poisoning is what started the Salem witch trials. Let's talk all about it. Let's Allow me to explain. <laughs> so Salem, Massachusetts, especially back in the 1690s, was in a very swampy and wet era area, right? So this mold would grow on the rye plants that they used to make bread. And many of them, being immigrants from Europe, are, were already accustomed to seeing this mold on the plant. So they weren't bothered by its existence. They thought it was just supposed to be there. So they would grind it up with the rest of the grain and make bread out of it. Well, some little girls got really, really sick with um, ergot and started hallucinating. And they were attributing these hallucinations to witchcraft. They were being touched and poked and pinched and prodded by witches. All the while, it is now being argued, they were having hallucinations and convulsions due to ergot poisoning. Oh, my gosh. Can you even believe? <laughs> well, so, oh. does that then argue the maliciousness of some of the people that played part in that? Um, it they absolutely does. Really bad highs, and they just didn't even know what they were saying. Yeah. It, <laughs> that could be a part of it. And I'll also, I mean, if you think about how the trials went down, if anybody's seen The Crucible, that's a pretty decent representation of how the Salem Witch Trials went down. But there would have even been time passes through, you know, the entirety of the Salem Witch Trials. So ergot may not have been a part of all of it, right? They may not have been hallucinating anymore. Um, but the initial thing against Tichuba and um, the girls hallucinating in the courtroom and convulsing in the courtroom, it was either an act or it was the result of ergot poisoning. Now, if you go further into the trials, they continue. And it has been argued that it wasn't so much a result of the poisoning anymore as people feeding into the hysteria of the times and the situation and just feeding on the fear and the hate. Because many people that were being accused of witchcraft were old women and people of color and, you know, single women, uh, people that dealt with medicine that weren't town doctors. 
things like that. And if you were cheated on, you could accuse witchcraft as being a part of that situation. So I think the entirety of the trials go further than ergot poisoning, but I, I am inclined to believe that's where it got its start. <clears throat> I, I don't, I don't dispute that because I mean, if you've got actual physical representation that are more than just a little girl pretending like, yeah, that could start some, that could spark some fears. Right. But the but the annoying part about that is back in 1095, they were studying ergot and they were using it in medicine and they were already finding methods to overcome the sicknesses that were caused by ergot. So it wasn't a new phenomenon that was occurring in, in the 1690s. It had been going on for almost seven for almost 500 years prior. So the fact that these people immediately jump to witchcraft, I feel, is just hate-based, and it has nothing to do with anything other than that. And, well, it's 2023, and those same types of people still exist. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so ergot poisoning from rye bread, delightful. Mm -hmm. um, so let's now talk about some, uh, some foods that were thought to be poisonous or hazardous to our health, and one that actually is hazardous to you. Well, Let's we'll do two, two that are hazardous to your health. The first food item I want to talk about that people thought were poisonous are tomatoes. Okay. Now, tomatoes are a part of the nightshade family, right? So there are variations of nightshades that are poisonous, deadly nightshade being one of them. Now, during the Middle Ages, people weren't utilizing things like ceramic for dishes they weren't using stainless steel because stainless steel hadn't been invented yet right they were using pewter for forks and knives cookware plates and even cups people were getting sick and dying because of eating tomatoes in things and they attributed it to the tomato themselves without actually understanding that the acids in the tomato were reacting with the lead and pewter and giving people lead poisoning. So I do have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What was it in the, tell me again, what the, what part of the tomato was causing the reaction? The acids in the tomato itself. The tomato so, juice is acidic. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. did other things that had acid in them, uh, I think lemons, did they notice the same kind of reactions with other things? Well, those types of fruits and whatnot weren't so much used um, the same way tomatoes were. They were they weren't um, they didn't garnish with lemons like we do today. They would use more of like the lemon zest and whatnot. Oh. And orange was a big thing, especially in the Middle East. But lemons weren't really popular during the middle mid medieval times for you know routine eating. Um, so that wouldn't have necessarily been a situation that they would have come across. And in, in, and even so lemon, isn't going to be a juice that you're going to drink by itself. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to be, you're not going to put a slice of lemon on a plate and eat it with a fork and knife. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So the, the acid interactions wouldn't be as significant as having tomato soup or gotcha. having um, tomato juice. Right. I love tomato soup. I, girl, I, I love a tomato soup. Um, you know, and they didn't even, tomatoes didn't even become popular um, up until like the 1880s. So even fairly recent times, like the 1880s, tomatoes were still thought to be poisonous. Do you know what food item made tomatoes popular again? What food item made tomatoes popular? Can you give me a hint? I can. It uh, it comes in a disc. Disc? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Pizza. With the with the popularization of pizza in the 1880s, tomatoes gained popularity too. Oh, well, pizza is delicious. So. Pizza is delicious. <clears throat> okay. The next food item that people thought were hazardous... Um, that isn't, isn't a wide known fear. Um, you know, it was very centralized, but potatoes in the pause, 18th century. Pause, 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 pause. He commands an audience. Uh, he Hi. Commands an... 
Erica said hello. He thinks we're he thinks we're on a uh, TikTok live or something and that we're talking to all of our friends. Oh my goodness. Any listeners, if you want to see Ramsey's, join our TikTok live chats that we have. Um, At still that Rob, still that guy Rob. TikTok.com slash still that guy Rob with two B's. And you can see this handsome little dark prince. Live and right, in ahead. charge. So behave. Okay, come and sit in the lap. I'm not I'm not playing a tarot card. You can come and sit in my lap. You just gotta behave. Come on, we're recording an episode. Hurry up. Okay. So in, in 18th century France, people um were scared of potatoes. They thought they were um harmful to your health. Um, in fact, potatoes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They didn't consume potatoes because of leprosy and rampant unchecked sexual urges that they believed potatoes were contributing to society. Um, and um, in hindsight, it's probably because the potato was thought to resemble a leper's foot and or testicles. Mm. There is a lot happening with that information. A lot. <laughs> there, there is a whole lot. Yeah. I I have feelings and I can't identify them. <laughs> Except to say potatoes? Potatoes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yes indeed. Yes indeed. Just um, something. something that wasn't <laughs> I I mean, I love a potato. I love a potato. Um so a food that um, one food that actually is potentially harmful that people eat all the time that don't know that it's harmful are cashews. I do not like cashews. It is a texture I'm thing. A fan. I'm not really a fan. They make they make decent like um, cheese substitutes for like vegan cheese because they're mm-hmm. a creamier consistency. Yeah. But as like me gnawing on like nuts or something, I'm not going to eat a cashew. I don't like it. But the cashews have a potential to blister, cashew shells specifically have a potential to blister the skin um, and distress stomach due to their anacardic acid presence. The toxins are typically limited to the outer shell, and when consumed raw, it can cause inflamed skin and rash. Um, It's similar to what's caused by poison ivy, which also releases a burning sensation. Cashews themselves, though, must be eaten only after being boiled or roasted. Raw cashew is the most dangerous as they possess uh, urushol, uh, urushiol, I guess. I don't know how to say that word. U-R-U-S-H-I-O-L. It's a chemical that leads to rashes and even um, demise, depending on how much is consumed. Oh, my God. Is that for all? Is cashews a tree nut? It is a tree nut. It think, is. Yeah, it's a tree nut. It grows on a, it grows on like, a, it looks like a berry. So does that, does, does that information pertain to then all tree nut allergies? Um, uh, so allergies are typically um, attributed to proteins. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when you're allergic to something, you're allergic to a protein or an enzyme or something like that. Um, we're talking about an acid. So it would be characteristic of this particular um, nut. There could be others that have this acid. Um, I didn't research all that. I just knew cashews were harmful, and I just wanted to get the the verbiage for this uh, for this conversation. But um, tree nuts in general, you can have an issue with because they all have similar proteins. Okay, mm-hmm. I got it. Yeah. Now let's talk about some foods <clears throat> that are that are hazardous. To my health. Are we going to go back to pizzas? Potentially. <laughs> Potentially. Go back to pizzas. We can attach the pole to this somehow, some way. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about a pesky little enzyme called bromelain. Okay. Now. People know about bromelain because you can buy it at the grocery store in a shaker, and it's called meat tenderizer, right? Oh. 
So the, the essential function of this enzyme is to break down proteins, right? So typically with meat, what it's going to do, it's going to, it's going to break down the connective tissue that holds the meat together, which is why it'll tenderize the meat. So if you sprinkle this, say on a piece of steak and let it sit overnight, you'll turn your steak into mush because it's going to break down all those proteins, right? Ew. And yeah, but uh, typically when you use bromelain, you're going to put it on the meat right before you cook it. And, it. and the cooking process kills off that enzyme, right? It renders the enzyme useless. Now, where is bromelain found? <clears throat> I don't it's know. Found. It's found in pineapples. Oh. Mm -hmm. So um, it's concentrated in the stem of the pineapple, but it is through the flesh as well. So there is bromelain in pineapple that um, will break down proteins. In fact, you can do a couple of things with pineapple as an experiment if you're feeling froggy. Make a batch of jello, mm -hmm. okay? And when you pour the jello into the mold, put in a fresh piece of pineapple in with the jello, okay? And then let it sit overnight. It won't congeal. The pineapple will prohibit the gelatin from seizing. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, if you marinate proteins in pineapple juice, like fresh pineapple juice, not the concentrated nonsense people buy at the grocery store. I'm talking fresh pineapple juice. If you marinate it with fresh pineapple longer than a couple of hours, you'll see the meat start to break down. People like to put pineapple on like chicken and ham a lot. And I've seen this firsthand. Um, a friend of mine marinated chicken breast with pineapples. Um, to make like a teriyaki inspired vibe and they didn't listen to me and I said well cook it with the pineapple don't marinate it with the pineapple right. and they were like you're just a chef you're not a food scientist blah, 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 blah. I'm like okay bro I mean that's fair that is fair I am not a food scientist but you're going to break down your chicken and you're going to have shredded chicken and you're not going to have chicken breast so just go with me on this journey, friend. He didn't believe me. He marinated it overnight, went to pull the chicken breast out, and it fell to pieces because proteins broke down due to pineapple. And um, it does the same thing to my tongue, okay? It, <laughs> pineapple freaks my tongue out so badly. I get blisters on my tongue, on my lips, on my gums. It's not great. It's not great. Um, canned pump, canned pumpkin, Jesus, I know where my mind is. Canned pineapple isn't so bad because it's cooked, but fresh pineapple freaks out my tongue. I don't like it. And that is 100% of the reason why that shit does not belong on pizza. I don't care what anybody says. That fruit is trying to eat you back and you're putting it on pizza. I, I, I don't understand. I trust your judgment as a chef, but you are not a food scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and you waited. Oh. You waited for me to take a drink. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I eat my pizza. I like it thin crust with extra sauce, pineapple, pepperoni, light cheese, and green olives. And that is my happy little pizza. I can get behind that except for that man eating fruit you put on top of it. I just. Uh... Now you react to mangoes though, don't you? Didn't you say you <laughs> Not mangoes, papaya. papaya. I, react, I react similarly to papaya, um, but I still eat papaya. It's not as bad as pineapple. Pineapple gives me blisters. Um, when I eat papaya, I get really bad upset stomach and, and my throat itches. A little bit that's called yeah. anaphylaxis but i mean and i don't eat pine papaya very often at all um it's probably like once every five or six years i'll be like ooh, i really want a papaya today and i just feel like dying today i just <laughs> but then i'll take you know some antihistamines and whatnot but some bit of prep right <laughs> papaya has an enzyme called papain in it and it also breaks down proteins um, and it's typically found in unripened papaya. So, um, I don't eat unripened papaya often, which is probably why the papaya doesn't bother me as bad as pineapple. I always eat ripened papaya, but you find more of the papain in 
unripened papaya and it, it's um found in what they're calling the the latex of the papaya because when it's not ripe the juice is like thick and white and it's stringy almost and they're calling it the papaya latex and that's where this enzyme is going to be found but there are some benefits to this enzyme it helps improve digestion it helps reduce inflammation you can use it as a wound heal and has wound healing properties for things like psoriasis um you know certain skin disorders and minor minor scrapes um and wounds it can be used for muscle pain relief sore throat remedies um, it helps fight infections. They're studying the possible anti-tumor effects, and they're studying the efficacy for shingles to help uh, treat shingles. Wow. So That's you can um, you can find papain enzyme in like pills and whatnot. Um, you most assuredly should not rub your skin with raw papaya, especially unripened papaya. It can burn your skin. Um, and when I handle papaya, especially the skin of the papaya, I wear gloves because it will break my skin out. But those are the two fruits that are dangerous to my health. And then the rest of them, besides cashews, were things that people thought were toxic. But there's there's a remarkably long list of foods that people felt were inedible up until modern times. My favorite one is lobster. People, especially in colonial times, lobster was fed to prisoners. It was considered cruel and unusual punishment. And now people spend 30 and $40 a pound. <laughs> for Can you lobster. touch on pufferfishes? You mm. told me that pufferfish puffer yeah. is not poisonous except for one part. Well, it's not so much one, one part. Okay. So pufferfish um does have neurotoxins in the fish the neurotoxins are concentrated in its organs so its liver its intestines things like that pancreas that kind of thing is where this uh, this toxic uh, this toxic chemical is found so when you're preparing um puffer fish you have to be very mindful on how you 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 know break the fish down if you puncture any of those organs that entire fish is done. You can't eat any of it. Now, because of the nature of the way your system works, and even in fish, blood and whatnot pass through these organs. So there are trace amounts of this of this um, uh, this poison um, in the flesh that we consume, but it's in such small doses that the flesh is safe to eat in certain quantities. I would not go to an all-you-can-eat puffer fish buffet and just gorge myself on, you know, puffer fish filet. But served as sashimi is typically in small portions, um, and that's perfectly safe. But if you puncture any of those organs, that renders all the meat toxic. And it can, oh. it can stop, it can, it freezes your central nervous system. It can cause you to not be able to breathe. It slows down your heart. It does a whole lot of things. Most people, when they eat puffer fish, I've had puffer fish a couple times, um, your lips can go numb. Um, sometimes your tongue can go numb and you get a little tingly. And that's uh. <laughs> and that's kind of the allure I find with things like puffer fish. But ultimately it's it's dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And if the the person preparing it isn't certified, you're you're flirting with death is what you're doing. People have died from eating tainted puffer fish. So it's not just you go to it, you find a chef, you have to find somebody that's got a certification in how oh, yeah, to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and most places, the only places I've ever had puffer fish in the United States, and I, I'm not speaking on places that have it that I don't know about. All I've ever, the only place I've ever seen fugu, which is puffer fish, is in San Francisco and maybe Los Angeles. But that's because I was in college in San Francisco. I haven't looked for it anywhere else. But I had it in San Francisco, and the chef that prepared it um, was trained in, Jap in Japan, and he was probably 110 years old <laughs> when he made my uh, sashimi. And, you know, he had been training for decades with pufferfish and had certifications in both the United States and Japan to prepare it. And That's it funny. Was, I didn't had to do that. It was uh, 2007, and my sashimi was $185. <clears throat> was it good it was delightful 
<laughs> but I can't imagine how much it is now <laughs> because that was, you know, 15 years ago. So. Well, you, you paid for the experience to us, Pose. The Pose. <laughs> They trick you where it says market price. I'm just saying that's where they get you. Mm -hmm. Where they get you. What else you got? Not, I mean, that was all I came to talk about was oh. dangerous foods. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna talk about some true crimey stuff now, aren't you? I'm going to incorporate some true crimey stuff. I'm gonna start first with um, a fun little plant called poison hemlock. Um, poison hemlock. Do you know about that? Okay, it's native to Europe, Western Asia, and North America, uh, where it was commonly mistaken for wild carrots, wild parsnip, or wild parsley. Uh, hemlock is poisonous from its seeds to its fruit. Uh, it's similar in look to Queen Anne's lace, and each plant can produce up to 30,000 seeds in one year. The seeds easily scatter through lawn mowing and other simple ways, causing them to be found on the roadside, edges of farm fields, parks, flower beds, and gardens. While it does fall into the carrot family, it can be fatal if eaten, causing severe symptoms within 15 minutes. Uh, it can be dated back to ancient Greece, where it was used to execute criminals and prisoners, including the 70-year-old philosopher Socrates in 399 BC. If you do have hemlock plants. You can use herbicides to kill the pre-flowering plant in late fall or early spring. Um, if you have to come in contact, you need to wear gloves, face masks, and protective clothing um, and place them into plastic bags for disposal. Do not burn the plants as fumes can be hazardous as well. Hemlock poisoning symptoms may include trembling, burning in the digestive tract, increased salivation, dilated pupils, muscle pain, muscle weakness, or paralysis, rapid heart rate, followed by a decreased heart rate, loss of speech, convulsions, unconsciousness or coma, central nervous system depression, uh, respiratory failure, acute, uh, I'm not even going to try it, breakdown of damaged skeletal muscle, acute renal failure, and death. Now, um, hemlock is used, though, to make medicines that can combat breathing problems like bronchitis, whooping cough, and asthma. It's also found in medicines used to ease pain conditions like baby teething, joint tissue, uh, joint issues, excuse me, and cramps. Um, it's also found in treatments for anxiety, mania, spasms, tumors, skin infections, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, SID and HAMS, chorea. Chorea is a movement disorder that causes sudden, unintended, and uncontrollable jerky movements of the arms, legs, and facial muscles, bladder infections, and to reverse strychnine poisoning. Ooh, strychnine poisoning. We will move on to that one. Um, but for <laughs> a lot of children that have death with hemlock um, can be related to them using the hollowed out stem as a whistle. Mm -hmm. And the stem i think can hold like the dead stem it's 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 detached it's dead can hold poison i think for up to three years <clears throat> yes and it also has some really interesting metaphysical uses as well really i'm it, i'm sure it's for the 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 white light good it thing. is for fluff bunny blessed beers yes now it can be used for purification so it, it can have that positive attribute it is oftentimes um, used in conjunction with Hecate, when a, you know the Greek goddess of magic and the crossroads. Mm -hmm. um, but in baneful workings, you can use it to remove someone's libido. Mm. Uh, it is known <laughs> as the opposite of Viagra, if you oh. ladies are going with that. And um, it does cause respiratory issues as well, so you can definitely put it in things to um you know flare body. asthma mm -hmm. flare, flaring of asthma mm -hmm. but people use it in, in curses and hexes as a libido squasher it squashes the libido mm. Mm -hmm. so if you want to break up a couple throw in some poison hemlock mm -hmm. we're not we're not advising people to do this um but just if you were already gonna do it mm -hmm. Wear gloves and burn it in a very well ventilated area. <laughs> All right, we're going to move trained on. Professional to... under the guidance of a trained professional. Let's not forget that part. 
we're going to move on to strychnine. So strychnine is originally found in India, Southern Asia, Northern Australia, and Hawaii. Um, it's a toxic alkaloid derived from the seeds of the Strychnos nux vomica, Strychnos ignatia, and Strychnos tante trees. Now, I'm going to say, I don't know if I said those things right, but you followed along. So that's all that matters. They're trees. Um, it was used in the 16th century in Germany as rat poison. Uh, but in India, China, and Japan, the seeds themselves were used as gastric medicine called vomica to strengthen muscle contractions, such as a heart or um, as a bowel stimulant and performance enhancing drug. So Alexander the Great may have drank strychnine laced wine in 323 BC. In the 1870s, Christiana, 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 whichever one, Edmonds laced chocolates with strychnine, causing several people to be poisoned and a four-year-old to die. Um, Belle Gunness, who was a wild woman of LaPorte, Indiana, allegedly used strychnine in some of her murders in the 20th century. Jane Stanford, the co-founder of Stanford University and wife of California Governor Leland Stanford, was murdered by strychnine poisoning by an unknown person in 1905. In 1938, this is going to be an exciting reference to the crossroads that you just had. Mm. In 1938, Delta Blues legend Robert Johnson, you ever heard of him? Yep. Uh, died after drinking a bottle of whiskey that was allegedly laced with strychnine. His death is disputed, though, since his death occurred several days after the poisoning. But Robert Johnson's legendary name is associated with the myth that he sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads in exchange for the mastery of the guitar. And there we um, are then. Yes. A featured story on Unsolved Mysteries was of Patsy Wright, who in October 1987 died from strychnine-laced cold medicine, and her murder remains unsolved. Um, so a little bit remember, about... I do remember hearing about that. I think, I don't know, my cousin and I sometimes will have dinner together, and we will sit there and watch, like, 80s Old and show. 90s. Yeah, 80s and 90s, like, Unsolved Murders or... You know, um, that one show where they are in the crime lab, Forensic Files, uh -huh. things like that. So I'm pretty sure I watched an episode about that poisoning. There is literally very, very little that is better than Unsolved Mysteries from the from the, the yesteryears. The yesteryears, yeah. Robert Stack was a horrifying voice that just, I think he influenced every single person alive today in some type of way or fashion. <laughs> Like there was, the show itself wasn't that scary except for the music and his voice. And his and voice. It was terrifying. <laughs> and he had such really good cliffhangers. Like yes. it was amazing. But it is fascinating to watch back on those episodes and see what has been updated, if they've been solved or whatever. So um, a little bit about strychnine poisoning. It can occur through ingestion, inhalation, smoked or snorted as in street drugs and through intravenous uh, methods. Symptoms usually occur within 15 to 60 minutes and include agitation, apprehension, or fear, ability to be easily startled, restlessness, uh, painful muscle spasms, possibly leading to fever and to kidney and liver injury, uncontrollable arching of the neck and back, rigid arms and legs, jaw tightness, muscle pain and soreness, difficulty breathing, dark urine, initial consciousness, and awareness of symptoms. People exposed to high doses of strychnine may have the following signs and symptoms within the first 30, 15 to 30 minutes of exposure, respiratory, re, blah, 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 blah. respiratory failure, inability to breathe, possibly leading to death and brain death. That sounds so, like a party. We are talking about party drugs this episode. <laughs> Let's okay. get some... Do not take strychnine in under any circumstances. Do not do this at all. Don't listen to anything that anybody says in this episode. All right. So we're going to move on now to arsenic, which is, I think, one of the most known contaminated things, like um, rather not contaminated things, but things that get contaminated with. Absolutely. Um, What was that? Is that movie called Arsenic and Lace? 
I think so. I think so too. That's a good movie though. If that's what I'm thinking it is, it's a good movie. Um, so arsenic can be found in seafood, rice, and rice products, mushrooms, and poultry, even in fruit juices, because arsenic can be found in soils, sediments, and groundwater. It can occur naturally or from mining or smelting, as in O-R-E smelting, uh, or mm -hmm. industrial uses. It was easily accessible and used from types of medicine to uh, treat diabetes, psoriasis, syphilis, skin ulcers, joint diseases, um, and used to poison also to even pigment and dye. Notably, the vibrant Shields Green from 1778 and Brilliant Greener Emerald in 1814. And have you ever seen those colors? Mm -hmm. They are so beautiful. Um, I guess if you, well, they're beautiful if you like greens. I love green. Green is my favorite color, but I think that they are astounding colors. Now, uh, yes, I'm inclined to agree. Recent evidence discovered by Italian scientists suggests that Fran uh, Francesco de Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and his wife were poisoned with arsenic in 1587. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte's death in 1821 is suggested to have been from arsenic poisoning during his imprisonment on the isle, uh, island of St. Listen, we have a Helena here, but I think it's Helena, St. Helena. Is that right? I would say Helena, yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, it's not just because I'm Southern and I can't pronounce things. We have a Helena. Um, <laughs> Forensic testing on his hair showed 13 times the normal amount of the element. However, that does not specify where or how the poisoning would have originated. Now, in 1938, the secret uh, there was a Secret Service agent named Stanley Phillips, and he worked undercover to meet with Herman Patrio, a food distributor and insurance man who had been using counterfeit money in Philadelphia. I don't know that Stanley knew what was happening, but he got a lot more than he bargained for when Patrillo, uh, Patrillo, Patrillo offered to pay the undercover agent $500 to murder a man whose wife would receive a life insurance payout. The agent did not have a chance to act on the plan, as in stop it, and the victim was poisoned by arsenic, resulting in his death later. The outcome of the scenario, though, was the arrest of 17 men and 17 women, including corrupt doctors and morticians in the conspirators and the criminal charges of 21 known deaths. Patrio admitted to providing poison for more than 100 deaths in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Delaware. Most frequently, the victims met their demise through arsenic-laced food and medicine. That is no fun at all okay so then this is a more recent case a japanese woman named i'm gonna try my best masumi hayashi m-a-s-u-m-i h-a-y-a-s-h-i that's is how currently, i would say it okay is currently on death row um after being convicted of four counts of murder on July 25th, 1998 she poisoned a communal pot of curry with 130 grams of arsenic Two children and two adults died, while 63 others suffered from acute arsenic poisoning. 130 grams? That's a, that's a, that is a lot of arsenic. Oh, my God. So with arsenic poisoning, your symptoms can occur within 30 minutes and may include abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, cough, chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, known as Dyspnea, apnea, D dyspnea, we'll say it's dyspnea, sore throat, pharyngitis, abnormal heart rhythm, arrhythmia, low blood pressure, hypotension, pins and needles sensations in the fingers and toes, red swollen skin, and a garlic odor in your breath and body tissues. Long-term exposure can take years to develop, but may include skin pigmentation changes, warts and lesions, hard patches on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, white lines on nails, persistent sore throat, and constant digestive issues. Hmm. I love the facial expression you're making right now. That is the best thing I've ever seen you do. <laughs> Isn't that something? 
that is something that you know people who 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 poison their significant other over years are just a special kind of evil they're just yeah. a special kind of evil Mm-mm. yeah Mm-mm. okay so now we're going to move on to something that kind of affects our time of the year right now cyanide Mm-hmm. cyanide no it was ours ars- i think it was arsenic and anyway cyanide uh naturally occurs in over two thousand plant species can be found in bamboo shoots say this word c-a-s-s-a-v-a-s cassavas cassavas okay and see girl hang on a second let me write it down because i now what what was the word baby C-A-S-S-A-V-A-S. Cassavas. Oh, yeah, cassavas. Cassava. Cassava. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And seeds or stones of apples, apricots, pears, plums, prunes, cherries, peaches, and more. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up knowing that you never ate the seeds or the stones. Like that was just something like if your parent gave you, like if my parents gave me like a fruit or something to eat, it was like, don't eat the pit or don't eat the whatever. Um. In these plants, the cyanides are bound to the sugar molecules in the form of cyan- cyanogenic glycosides. It's not going to get better than that. <laughs> so, um, this is from the cdc.gov website. In manufacturing, cyanide is used to make paper, textiles, and plastics. It is present in the chemicals used to develop photographs. Cyanide salts are used in met- metallurgy metallurgy for electroplating, metal cleaning, and removing gold from its ore. Cyanide gas is used to exterminate pests and vermin in ships and buildings. Um, Cyanide is a rapidly acting, potentially deadly chemical that interferes with the body's ability to use oxygen. It sure does. It can be used, um, or excuse me, it can be a colorless gas or liquid such as hydrogen cyanide or cyanogen chloride. Uh, cyanide can also be a crystal, which is a solid solid form, such as sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide. So I think we're going to focus more on the potassium cyanide, so the crystal. Um, cyanide is sometimes described as having a bitter almond smell, but does not always give off an odor, and not everyone can detect this, this odor, which I think is, fan- is, is so interesting that not everybody right. can smell it. And I was so glad that you mentioned the bitter almond smell. Because um, <laughs> I uh, was watching, I'm, I rewatched the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, mm-hmm. and because uh, it's dark and spooky, and I love it. And the aunt <laughs> made one of her rivals a batch of almond cookies, like little tea biscuits. Mm-hmm. And the person was just eating them and eating them. She goes, "These are delightful. I love the flavor of almond." And she's like, "Yes, you use almond to cover the flavor of cyanide." Oh, no. Oh, and just no. smiled. And then the woman's head hit the table. <laughs> Listen, though, I got to be honest. My mother-in-law makes um, her little <clears throat> sugar cookies with almond flavoring in them. I would die happily. <laughs> oh, she she knows I love her cookies, too. If she ever wanted to take me out, that's, that's the way. That's what I would choose. <laughs> um, so after a, re- a release of cyanide into air, people can be exposed through skin contact or eye contact, inhaling um, or inhaling uh, by breathing in the gas. Breathing in the cyanide gas causes symptoms to appear the quickest, but swallowing swal- uh, swallowing solid or liquid cyanide can be toxic also. If it is released into water, people can be exposed by touching or drinking the water. Um, and doing that can also release um, it can also produce hydrogen cyanide gas, which you can then breathe in. So with water, you can touch it, drink it, or breathe it. Eating or drinking or touching food contaminated with uh, cyanide can expose people to it. Contaminated food is more likely with the solid forms of cyanide. Um, if food is not contained in glass or metal, but in like plastic paper or cloth containers, it can become contaminated. So don't eat it. If you think it's contaminated, don't eat it. 
I mean, that should be just general knowledge. If you think something has cyanide poisoning, you should probably just not t touch it. Pro probably just not. <clears throat> or do. I mean, live your life. Don't but... question yourself. Don't question yourself and be like, you know, it's probably okay. <laughs> it fell on cyanide. Five second rule. It's good. Um, if the food is in un is in an undamaged sealed glass or metal container, it should not be affected by a cyanide release. But again, just go to McDonald's. <laughs> I'm of the belief if cyanide is anywhere near my food, I'm just not. I'm just not. There you go. I'm so, full to capacity. I'm not going to eat. I'm good. I am not that hungry right now. <laughs> Symptoms include chest pain, chest tightness, confusion, dizziness, eye pain, eye tearing, excitement, difficulty breathing, headache, nausea, rapid or slow heart rate, rapid or slow breathing, restlessness, shortness of breath, and vomiting, weakness, and wheezing. That sounds like a Saturday morning to me. Like, let's be real. Getting out of bed. <laughs> Symptoms from cyanide poisoning can progress very rapidly when exposed to a large, oh, excuse me, a large amount of cyanide. Exposure to the large amount of cyanide by any route may cause other health effects as well. Coma, death, higher low blood pressure, loss of consciousness, lung injury, and seizures. I love how they were like coma and death are number one on that list. Coma and... <laughs> yeah. So now we get into the spooky season of the year. Mm -hmm. Cyanide poisoning is one of the reasons behind the encouragement to check Halloween candy each year. I don't know if you know this story. I bet you do. Um, on October 31st, 1974, in Texas, eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien died en route to the hospital less than an hour after eating a pixie stick. Now, pixie sticks, for those that don't know, it's like a straw with powdered candy in it. Yeah, ground up sweet tarts is what it tastes yeah. like. Mm -hmm. So um, the way that I didn't write this, I don't have this written down, but from what I remember of reading the father took his kids out trick or treating and the kids, they tried to go to a house and it was not, they were not doing trick or treating candy that year or something. And the kids ran ahead. Well, he, the father caught up later and said, Oh, here, I got these pixie sticks. There were five of them. So the pixie stick was found to be laced with potassium cyanide. His father, Timothy O'Brien's father, an optician, optician, and a deacon, Ronald Clark O'Brien, was found guilty in the death of his son. Why? Do you want to guess why? I mean, you, you lost me at deacon. I'm Now I'm just convinced. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't for Jesus. No part of it was for Jesus. Thank you for clearing that part up. You're I welcome. was confused. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I was just throwing it in there that he was a beacon of his community. Oh. But the reason why he killed his son was for a life insurance payout of $100,000 to ease his financial debt. <laughs> Timothy's sister, Elizabeth. So this man had two children. He had uh, Timothy and Elizabeth. And three other children were all given the candy. However, luckily... Timothy's sister, Elizabeth, and the three other children did not eat it. They were given the candy, though, in an effort to try to cover up his crime as if it was a random event of these cyanide-laced candies being given out at a house. <sighs> so, um, Ronald was arrested, or yeah, well, obviously he was arrested and sentenced to death and was executed by lethal injection of his own on March 31st, 1984. As well he should have. As well he should have. Next, we kind of go back in time, two years, um, to yeah. Chicago. That was, was the back it? in time. Oh, back, back in, in time. the way back machine. Did you ever watch a show called The Roundhouse? I sure did. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love <laughs> that show. Okay. So cyanide poisoning was also the cause in Chicago for Tylenol murders. Um, yes. In 1982, the murders claimed the lives of seven people, all having turned to the pain reliever Tylenol to remedy various ailments. As September one does. As mm -hmm. one does. 
Uh, September 28th, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman was hospitalized after taking a capsule of extra strength Tylenol. She died September 29th. On that day, 27-year-old Adam Janus, 25-year-old Stanley Janus, and 20-year-old Teresa Janus all took Tylenol from a single bottle. They each died. 31-year-old Mary McFarland, 35-year-old Paula Prince, and 27-year-old Mary Reiner also passed after consuming Tylenol. Um, so there's a lot of information on this, but I just kind of picked and pulled uh, through the investigations. Let uh, It led to Tylenol recalls, one of the largest in pharmaceutical history. And despite DNA being recovered from the bottles, no charges have ever been secured against a particular person. However, Ted Kaczynski was looked at as possibly Ted Kaczynski. Been, yeah, as possibly having been who did it, but he was okay. never. Um, copycat poisonings also claimed lives. So in 86, 23 year old Diane Ellsroth in New York died after ingesting extra strength Tylenol capsules laced with cyanide. Susan Snow and Bruce Nickel were poisoned by cyanide laced Excedrin capsules in Washington state. Bruce Nichols' wife, Stella Nichol, was arrested and convicted for the murders of her husband and Susan Snow. Then there was um, a student at the University of Texas named Kenneth Ferries, who was found dead in his apartment from cyanide-laced anison capsules. But while at first it was ruled a homicide, the uh, medical examiner changed the ruling to suicide, sourcing that the poison came from a lab where Kenneth worked. So really unfortunate there. In 91 in Washington state, Kathleen Daniker and Stanley McHorter were murdered with cyanide-laced Sudafed. Jennifer Melling was poisoned and went into a coma, but recovered. Jennifer's husband was convicted on multiple charges, including the murder of Kathleen, Stanley, and the attempted murder of Jennifer. So this all led to tamper-resistant packaging that we know today. Well, we have more advanced tam tamper resistant packaging, um, but also changed the product tampering to be a federal crime. And it led the companies to leave capsules behind, breakable capsules with the powder and stuff inside and move to a more designed solid caplet. So you could not just buy it, break it open, replace the insides and then close it back up and put it back on the shelf. So, we're almost done. Um, we move on now to what Paul Dawson studied with salmonella. Ooh. Salmonella, yes. Salmonella. Um, <laughs> from T and F online, in 1855, Theobald Smith discovered and isolated bacteria strains from the intestines of pigs infected with classical swine fever. That strain was named after Dr. Daniel Elmer Salmon, an American pathologist who worked with Smith. Um, salmonella infection occurs usually when eating raw or undercooked meat, poultry eggs or egg products, drinking unpasteurized milk, or it can occur from eating some raw fruits and vegetables. Isn't that why you can't eat raw cookie dough? It's because of the eggs. So salmonella in the eggs. Yeah. Okay. But real on my eating habits. I wish somebody would tell me that I can't have cookie dough. You've got me twisted. And cake batter, absolutely. I lick the fucking mixers. Don't play with me. Listen, I don't know about cake batter, but I know that they make now safe cookie dough, raw cookie dough that you can eat. Yeah, that, they, they need to get on the cake batter train. Because, right. And brownies. Oh, right. my. And, and, you know, there's also a fear of uncooked flour. Um, being contaminated with things like E. coli and salmonella. So or they don't ergot. want people, huh? Or got. Or <laughs> even if you cook that or shit, or it won't fix it. But <laughs> so in those safe cookie batters that you buy, um, they not only omit the egg or they would use a pasteurized egg product, but they also cook the flour typically as well. So, um, with this infection, symptoms can occur from six hours to six days from exposure, which gives you plenty of time to enjoy your raw cookie dough without regret. Six hours is a long time to be satiated. Um, but it's sort of similar to the flu, possible symptoms of diarrhea, 
stomach cramps, fever, nausea, vomiting, chills, headache, and blood in the stool. The infection can last a few days to a week with diarrhea occurring up to 10 days and in some cases bowels not returning to usual stool habits for several months. Now, the CDC estimates that salmonella bacteria causes about 1.35 million infections, 27,000 hospitalizations, and 450 deaths every year. So it's something that's still happening. We're it still- is, absolutely. And a lot of it happens from contaminated water, especially when it comes to produce, mm -hmm. um, contaminated water and cross-contamination. So that's why like, when you're working in a kitchen or you're working around food, having sanitation education is super duper important. That's why because the most... on the bathroom walls, wash your hands. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, that and like um, cooking raw meat and then produce. If you don't change the knife, don't change the cutting board, and you don't wash your hands, you're going to cross contaminate those things. And you could potentially give someone salmonella or E. coli. So, and Can you make me most... feel better about something? What's that? I don't know why, but I have this thing with raw meat on a wooden cutting board. Okay. It freaks me out. I think to myself, no matter how off, how much I wash this thing, there's raw meat. Right. Okay. So the most, raw meat. most quality wooden cutting boards mm -hmm. are going to be made out of wood that are naturally antimicrobials. Right. Mm -hmm. So bacteria doesn't survive in wood that type of wood okay right? but i'm kind of just against wooden cut cutting boards in general just because i don't i feel the same way i don't feel as though they're cleaned enough yeah um but and most restaurants don't use wooden cutting boards so if you have a wooden of. cutting board you should probably not use it on things that might get you sick well, I mean, I I can't say that because as I said, those what most of those wooden cutting boards are made with antimicrobial wood. There are species of wood of trees that are antimicrobial, so bacteria won't flourish in them. But also knowing how to effectively sanitize your equipment is super duper important. Um, we don't sanitize as well at home most of the time as we do in a restaurant, right? right. Typically. People... Right. I'm not, and I, I'm clearly not speaking for everybody, but most people are not going to use a sanitizing solution after they've washed something, right? They're going to throw their cutting board, their knives, their plates in the dishwasher and use one of those Dawn fucking tabs, right? Mm -hmm. Which is soap and hot water. And most dishwashers do get hot enough to kill bacteria but they're still not utilizing a sanitation solution after. So eating in a restaurant more often than not is safer than eating at home because of the sanitation. Um, and you'll find that most of the time when someone gets food poisoning from a restaurant, it's not so much anything the restaurant did, it's contaminated produce that they received. Mm. Um, so like the romaine lettuce and the cilantro debacle a few years ago, that had nothing to do with the sanitation within the restaurant. That produce came in contaminated with that bacteria. And you can't just wash some of that off. You know what I mean? Especially if it's grown with water contaminated with E. coli and salmonella. There's no washing that off the produce. <laughs> okay. You, it's in the produce, right? Right. Um, so... The important thing to keep in mind about salmonella is, especially when it comes to contact with it, wash your fucking hands. Wash your hands. Um, you can get it. Mama, moms can get it from changing children's diapers. You know, or parents in general can get it from changing diapers. People who are caring for the elderly can get contaminated with salmonella and E. coli. The, the trick is to not have any open wounds on your hands. And to wash them before they touch anywhere on your face. Now, listen, you are, you are segueing me perfectly. Oh my God. I'm so good at this game. I love that. And to that salmonella bacteria can sometimes result. Some types of salmonella bacteria can result in typhoid fever. Mm -hmm. Typhoid fever symptoms can include fevers that start low and increase throughout the day, possibly reaching as high as 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 40 degrees Celsius, 
chills, headache, weakness, and fatigue, muscle aches, stomach pain, diarrhea, or constipation, and a rash. Uh, you may also experience a cough, loss of appetite, and sweating. A few weeks after symptoms start, the illness can cause problems in the intestines, making stomach pain, um, a very swollen stomach, and sometimes spreading sep uh, sepsis, which is infection caused by gut bacteria that's spreading throughout the body. In some cases, people may become confused and not able to pay attention or react to anything around them, and those are considered life-threatening complications. In some people, symptoms may return up to a few weeks after the fever has gone away. So now we move on to talk about typhoid. Um, from newsmedical.com, uh, excuse me, .net, Carl Joseph Eberth was the first to describe the bacillus Yes, bacillus, 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 that was suspected to cause typhoid fever in 1880. Four years later, pathologist George Gafke confirmed the link, naming the bacillus Eberthal typhi, known today as Salmonella typho typhosis. However, typhoid fever is thought to be responsible for the widespread plague in Athens in 430 BC that wiped out one third of the population, including the leader Pericles. His successor, T-H-U-C-Y-D-I-D-E-S, Thucydides? I, I would say that, yeah. We'll go with it. Also contracted the disease, but did not die from it. Much later in time, Virginia-based English colony Jamestown is also thought to have died out from typhoid fever. Um basing in that between 1607 and 1624, more than 6,000 settlers died from typhoid fever. And in the American Civil War, more than 80,000 soldiers died from dysentery or typhoid fever. The Spanish-American War also had infections from typhoid. So now we're going to talk about a couple specific people. A woman named Mary Mallon, who is also commonly known as Typhoid Mary, um, was most likely, excuse me, was, now I typed this and I know that that's not correct, but what I have is the most widely known carrier of typhoid fever. She is the most commonly known. So um, she was born in 1869 in Ireland and emigrated to the U.S. in 1884. Keep that in mind. She was the first person in the United States to be identified as a carrier of the pathogen responsible for the disease although she did not experience any symptoms related to the condition. So this woman carried it. She never showed signs of it, but she had it in her, in her body always. She worked in a variety of domestic positions for wealthy families before settling into a cook role. Um, throughout her career, she is thought to have infected 51 people of which three cases proved fatal. So she would work in these people's homes and spread Typhoid. Um, doctors theorize she spread typhoid bacteria by simply what? Failing to wash her hands. She was forcibly isolated for quarantine in 1907. She was put on an island. Um, in 1910, she did not go willingly, by the way. In 1910, the health department released her on the condition she never work as a cook or food handler again. They said, okay, look, we'll let you back into, so into society, but you have to promise us that you're never going to cook for anybody again. She said, okie dokie. <laughs> However, she was forced into isolation again in 1915 after an epidemic broke out at a sanatorium in Newfin Newfoundland, New Jersey, and at Sloan Maternity Hospital in Manhattan, where she had worked at both places as a cook. The second time she was not released lit and later died in isolation at the age of 69. She spent a total of 26 years in quarantine isolation. Now you say, how is that possible when everybody knew about her? Because she changed her name. Now, here we go. We are at the end. In 1922, a New York man named Tony LaBella caused two outbreaks that combined for more than 100 cases and five deaths. However, typhoid Tony has lower notoriety. Why? Because Mary was a female Irish immigrant and domestic worker. 
And the U.S. went through a we hate the Irish, we hate the women, and we hate the domestic worker. And so her case trumps his in notoriety. It sure does. Mm-hmm. However, now advancements in antibiotics and supportive care and knowing to wash our fucking hands has lowered mortality rates of typhoid to 1% to 2%. Yep. Like, we did it. We did it. <laughs> Good job, Erica. I, you know, I am astounded every time I use a public bathroom and someone doesn't wash their hands when they're done. I think there have been TikToks in like in upheaval lately over a girl that went to the bathroom and did not wash her hands. Like, or maybe she was talking about not washing her hands to her friend. Uh, And people are like, that's gross. And other people are like, yeah, I just don't see the point of it. Um, Typhoid. Typhoid fever. Yes. Shigalosis. E. coli. You know, like. (laughs) And like people don't think about all the things that their hands touch throughout the day, right? They they just don't think about it. That dollar bill you got from the gas station, where did that dollar bill no? So I don't carry I don't carry cash. I think cash is disgusting. I don't like it. Um my cell phone I wipe down three or four times a day just because I know it's disgusting. You know what I mean? Like people just don't think. And I think because I became a chef and I'm around like food and I really I you know pay attention to my hands so much because like I handle people's food that mm-hmm. it altered my perception on like bacteria and cross contamination. Did you just thumbs up me? Is that what just happened? I did not touch my phone. Oh, you're making a thumbs up. Oh, it does it automatically. Okay. I'm like, that's what? so fun. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um that's what's happening right now. Oh my I god! No, I have no idea what's going on. Zoom is so pumped that we're done with this episode too. They're like, <laughs> Zoom is like, thank goodness, God, <laughs> it took forever. <laughs> um, but so, like, washing your hands is fundamentally important, especially if you're using a bathroom. Like our bodies and our hands, like, fine. If you're if you're if you live alone, and you're not handling anything of anybody else's, fine. Take a leak and don't wash your hands. But you touch that bathroom door handle to enter or leave that bathroom, it's disgusting. It's You can swab it and send it off and it will send you the culture. It is disgusting. And I'm one of those people that will wash my hands and then use that towel to open the door because I'm not touching it. I'm not not doing it. Girl, my bag is in the other room, but I keep hand sanitizer in my bag because I... Did you have one of those door hook openers that came out when Corona hit first real hard? No, like I didn't leave my house little- <laughs> if I could help it. I would I would go to work, um, but then I'd go home. Like, I didn't do shit during COVID. Um, and um, I would use, I had I would bring, like, rubber gloves if I had to go anywhere and open the door. But I also was taking care of my sister and, you know, helping my parents out. My mom is severely asthmatic, and my sister has a an encyclopedia of health conditions. So I was very, very careful about contaminating the air in the house. Right. So I would, um, when I would get home, I would strip in the garage and I would have clothes waiting for me. Right. When I would get home from work. So I would strip down and put on the clothes I had left there. And my clothes immediately went into the washing machine um, I wore a mask everywhere. Um, if I was touching anything, I had rubber gloves on um, just because I can't bring that shit to my sister and my mother. They could, they, if they had contracted COVID, they probably could have died, especially that initial before the vaccines. If they had gotten COVID, they absolutely could have had some serious effects from it. So I was very, very vigilant during COVID. In your professional experience as a chef, uh-huh. have you been um, privy to knowledge wise or happened to be there when something happened food wise that led to some type of a poisoning situation or have you not by your hand necessarily. I don't think that you would do that, but I think what, what has directly been environmental to you that has taken place restaurant um, or. Well, so none. I've never worked in a place that had any kind of outbreak of food poisoning. 
uh-huh. first of all. Yeah. So, um, but I had been affected by other restaurants, um, food poisoning issues, especially when it came to romaine lettuce uh, about seven years ago. Um, romaine, there was a almost a worldwide, well, at least I'll say nationwide issue with romaine lettuce being contaminated. So they destroyed the entire crop of romaine lettuce that all originated, I want to say Mexico, but it was several years ago. So we couldn't get romaine lettuce at all. Um, I remember I remember this. This was like recent years, right? Yeah, it was probably seven years or so ago. Yes, yeah. Um, we couldn't get romaine lettuce at all. Um, and we used romaine lettuce as our main salad base for all of our salads. Right. So we couldn't get romaine lettuce. We were having trouble getting cilantro for a long time because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and then, um, so as far as bacterial contaminations, no, I've never worked in a place that was the epicenter of a food borne illness situation. I have worked in places where there have been what's called physical contaminants in the food, um, which a physical contamination can be broken glass, plastic, you know, whatever. Um, I worked at a pizza place and I'm not going to say the name of the pizza place because, you know, whatever. Um, It was, it did happen in my store. I was not working that day, but we got dough in from our commissary and it was already patted out and ready for us to like proof and use. Um, Huh? Was it a normal thing for it to already be? Yeah, that's how we got our pizza dough. It got shipped to us, you know, and we would then let it rise and then we would use it to make pizzas. Well, in the commissary, they were um, on trays that I guess were starting to crack or splinter or something. But inside the dough, we couldn't see it when we were making the pizza, when we cut the pizza, nothing. But there were pieces of what looked like a plastic container that were inside the dough. Oh my gosh. Um, A customer had ordered a pizza and then called me freaking out the next day and, um, you know, said that we tried to unalive him. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. Bring it in. So he brought it in. I could clearly see the plastic embedded in the dough. And so we had Uh to send it we had to send it off to a third party company for it to be um, investigated and they handled it from there. Um, Mm -hmm. But I've never worked in a place that had like an epicenter of foodborne illness at all, but you'd be surprised. Can you touch on listeria and ice cream? Because I really don't know much about listeria. I just know that like there are companies that have repeat issues um, well, let's let's let me look into some things because off off the top of my head, no, I can't speak on listeria and ice cream. All right, listeria it is a serious infection usually caused by eating food contaminated with the bacteria listeria monocytogenes. Okay, it's okay. We're, Pregnant women, diagnosis and treatment, questions and answers, prevention. Okay, so where is listeria found? It looks like it's found in a lot of dairy. Unpasteurized Mm -hmm. soft cheese, brie, sliced cheese. Okay. Because I know uh, from my pregnancies, one of the things they always said was to not eat soft serve ice cream. Right. You cannot eat soft serve ice cream while you're pregnant. So basically what I'm seeing is, okay, so these are not going to be any things that I would typically have dealt with. Um, I mean, with soft cheeses, I guess, like sliced cheese for delis and whatnot, um, cold cuts, we slice all of our own meat, uh, um, pre-made deli salads. Hmm. I've never experienced anything with listeria, thankfully. Can you share a little bit about E. coli as a general? E. coli, as a general, yeah, it's one of those um, bacteria that um, you need to, like, it's kind of like with salmonella. You need to wash your fucking hands, mm-hmm. honestly. Like, um, it lives in your intestines, first of all. I remember that much. So, Always E. coli typically, huh? Always in everybody? Or it's and, just... And people, animals, it lives in your intestines. 
right? Um, the 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 thing is, <laughs> E. coli contamination happens because of unsanitary growing conditions when it comes to produce. So basically, poop water. If things are grown in poop water, they're going to be contaminated with E. coli. So you need to be super duper careful where you get your shit, right? Um, and it also can be found in raw meat, right? So undercooked ground beef specifically is a problem with E. coli. Um, and that's because the bacteria is on the surface of the meat and they grind it all up. It's all kind of grown in there together. Now, the issue with things like E. coli is it one of the major symptoms of E. coli is diarrhea, right? And yeah. typically it's pretty severe diarrhea when you have um, E. coli. Also, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, there are many different types of E. coli and most of them are harmless. There are a few that cause things like diarrhea. It's not just E. coli in general. There are specific strains that, that fuck with you. We're but, not scientists at all. Right. I'm a chef and she's a hypnotist. Like, and she, and he, he's not a food scientist. No, I'm not a food scientist. I he doesn't just, know about the pineapple on pizza. Obviously. Um, um, a lot of times, especially in restaurants, if it's not from contaminated food that they receive, it's because someone in the restaurant has E. coli. They use the bathroom, they clean themselves, but they don't wash their fucking hands. And then they touch everything else. And, and everybody then they touch everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's gross. But E. coli is completely preventable. Um, and the transfer is completely pre preventable, especially like salmonella. Just wash your hands. Wash your hands, make sure that you're using safe, clean water to prepare your food. Don't use contaminated water. Um, yeah, and make sure you're buying your vegetables from reputable people. Don't just necessarily go to the food truck on the side of the highway and buy your fucking carrots. You know what I mean? You got to, you know, um, there are industry standards in every aspect of food service, be it production, be it service, be it all of it, there are conditions that have to be met and they are graded by the FDA, right? The Food and Drug Administration and or the local health department. Don't buy random shit from random people that you don't know where they grew their food. You know, it's a really much bigger problem in more impoverished countries. Where you're because, limited to what you can do. Right, and the access to clean water is more difficult. But that's the biggest thing with E. coli is clean water. Is there a type of food or a, is there something that you know you will never, ever touch, period? You know it is nasty. The hazard is high. Like, I know some people will not touch pork. Uh, okay. So the, the thing about pork is a lot of it has to do with culture, religion, and it also has to do with um, the fact that pigs will eat whatever you feed them. Um, I love pork. I, I eat the, huh? the nothing, the nothing nice side, um, side note here. Boars will eat anything. Boars, just boars. Just boars. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like boars. hair or teeth though. Just boars. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. so as far as that, uh, there are some types of cheeses I won't eat because of how they're made. Um, one of them's expensive as shit anyway, so I won't waste the money on it, but it's, it's got maggots in it. I won't eat that. I'm what not huge. I don't remember the name of it. It's Italian. Um, but it's maggots. It's fucking maggots. That's what it is. It's maggot cheese. Um, uh, no hate on Italians that love it. I could never, um, I'm totally Googling maggot cheese. <laughs> um, other oh than that. Oh, <laughs> Sue Martzu. Mm -hmm. Continue, please. I'm just looking at maggots and cheese. But yeah, I can't think of anything that like I I don't eat just because of the danger. Um, I eat my steak rare almost. I eat my steak Chicago or blue style rare. I eat steak tartare, which is raw. I eat sashimi. Sh sashimi is inherently dangerous too because fish have um, parasites a lot of the time. So, I mean, that's dangerous. You get ringworm, you're not ringworm, but you get a 
Um, fucking worms. You get worms from eating raw fish if you're not careful. Uh, but I eat all those things because I'm here for a long. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. So I'm not really so much bothered by the that. Um, I like eating things that I enjoy. And state tartar is one of my favorite things on the planet. I love it. So how do you safely prepare these things? So a lot of it has to do with knowing where your, your food is coming from. So when I make steak tartare, I'm not going to Kroger and buying steak. I'm going to go to a butcher. I'm going to go to someone who specializes in just meat. Um, fish. Okay. So the thing about fish, especially, you know, eating raw fish. Now, in Japan, it will work completely differently than here. I'm not sure. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked into it, how we get sushi grade fish in the United States right? Typically, you're going to purchase fish, and if you're going to use it in the raw application, it needs to be frozen at below zero degrees for at least three days. That will kill any parasite in the fish, right? Um, and that's the only time I've ever dealt with for my making myself like sushi or sashimi is using fish that is intended for sushi, but has been frozen for at least three days. So in that act of freezing, it kills mm -hmm. what is in the fish. Mm -hmm. That's a parasite. Mm -hmm. Bar any other contamination that occurs after it's unfrozen, mm -hmm. it's good. It should be, yeah. I mean, okay. that, I mean, you can't be 100% sure of anything. Right. But there still could be some bacteria. There still could be this. There still could be that. And that's just going to be part of it. You can't have... Food is some foods are dangerous inherently because they're dangerous and there's nothing you can do to mitigate all of the risks. Eating raw or undercooked meat can, in fact, make you sick. There's not much you can do about that. Yeah. I, however, am not Donald Trump. I will not be eating my steak well done. It is not going to happen. I will continue to eat my steak rare and that's just it. I continue to eat my pork medium to medium rare and that's just going to be how it is. I like my salmon medium. I like my tuna rare. I mean, that's just it. That is <laughs> what it is. And it, it, there is risk involved to eating undercooked meat. I am more inclined to cook ground meat more thoroughly than I am steak. Um, ground beef, like if I get a hamburger, I'm going to get it medium, medium well. For First and foremost is the texture. I don't like... Uh, the way ground beef feels when it's undercooked. It doesn't, I don't like the mouthfeel. Um, but also most bacteria on fresh meat, right? I'm not saying like if the meat has gone rancid, but most bacteria is going to live on the surface of the meat. When you sear it, you kill off that bacteria. Ground meat, that surface now becomes the inside and it's just all through it. So it's much more safe for you to cook ground meat all the way through. So question, um, back a long time ago, before refrigerators were a thing, they would cover them in salt. What would mm -hmm. the salt do? Salt is an antimicrobial, and it also helps to remove moisture that give um, bacteria the conditions to live. Oh. So, so it's called curing. So things like hams are typically cured. Bacon is typically cured. Um, a lot of um, hard sausages are typically like cured. You can air cure, you can salt cure, you can sugar cure. Uh, there's a lot of methods and it's the removal of the moisture that helps to preserve the meat and keep it from being, you know, eaten by bacteria. Um, so if it's air, uncured, like if it's advertised as being uncured. That's the same thing as unsweetened tea. That doesn't mean it was cured and then the cure removed. That just means it wasn't cured. Right. So it's just wet. Yeah, it's just, well, it's just not, it's not, I wouldn't say. I well, wouldn't use the it word. naturally has its moisture. Right, but it, it it didn't go through a process of of being cured. So, um, so things like bacon, if you get uncured bacon, that's just sliced pork belly. In the United States, sliced pork belly. That may be smoked. It might be, um, you know, uh brined but it's not going to be cured right and ham you can get fresh ham that's not been cured mm -hmm. what is waffle house bacon because like that's the bacon that is my 
that is my Mount Everest of bacon. Is most most bacon. restaurants get cured bacon. Most restaurants get cured bacon. Yeah. Or smoked. They'll get smoked or cured. Yeah. And a lot of times, things that are smoked aren't smoked. They have flavor injection that gives them the flavor of being smoked. That's sneaky. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's false practices right there. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to get into false practices, when you buy chicken or steak or anything at a grocery store that says it's a pound, at least a third of that is water they injected into the animal. It has nothing to do with how much the meat actually weighs. So when you buy like lean meat, mm -hmm. what? how does that reflect in what you just said? Okay, so lean meat is fat to meat ratio. Well, it's so, going to break down to, or it's yeah, going to cook so like, Right. So when you buy beef, you'll see things like 75, 25, you'll see 90, right. 10, 80, 20. That means 80% of the weight of that hamburger is meat and 20% of the weight is fat. So what you're actually buying, what you're going to be able to eat is 80% of whatever yeah. is in that. Region. Yeah. So basically if you get, say you get 10 pounds of ground beef and it's 80, 20, you're mm -hmm. actually only getting eight pounds of meat and you're getting two pounds of fat. I see. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why awesome. it shrinks up so much. <laughs> that's what? That's why it shrinks. Yeah. When it comes to ground beef. Yeah. Um, I used you to get the, the 90 10 or the whatever the 80 thing is. I try to aim for those because I, when it comes to ground beef for me, depending on what I'm doing, I prefer an 80 20 at the, the most lean. Anything above an 80 20 is going to be really dry. Mm. fat leads to moisture and flavor, right? So if I'm making meatballs or I'm making hamburgers or something like that, I want mm. it to be a little fattier. I want it to be like a 75-25 or an 80-20. I don't want to go anything above 80-20. Then they're just dry and crumbly. But if you're health conscious, then you're you're going to just use ground meat, you know, um, in your diet for well. whatever. Get 90-10, absolutely. Yeah. I just don't like the texture. It tastes like sand. Well, that's all that I had. What else do you have? <laughs> nothing. I has nothing. This is a very long episode, but you know, it's very informative. And it I'm is. very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I have so uh, hungry. <laughs> I have a uh, meat that I'm getting ready to uh, grind up because I make a lot of my own ground beef again, because yeah. I'd like to know where my meat comes from. And uh, so I'm going to grind up some hamburger and I'm going to make uh, some stroganoff. I was going to just dice up the steak, but I don't feel like it. So I'm just going to grind it up and use ground beef and make some stroganoff. I have no idea what we're going to have for dinner, but I really wish that Paul would make his chili. <laughs> With the but sweet I potatoes? Had in the time. Yes. Sweet potatoes or butter butternut squash. Mm -hmm. Either have become a delicious treat. It does not delicious. matter. Delicious. Thanks for joining us. We love y'all sweet pumpkins. Stay safe. And remember to fix your mouth. Make sure to like, share, follow, and subscribe to get updates and our latest episodes.